Amen. Would you turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30. This story is about David and his conflict with the Amalekites. I believe we have some Amalekites in our country as well. Uh, and here's what David did. And David faced some serious trouble in his life. The Bible picks it up in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, where the scripture says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag. On the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag. They attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And then they took captive the women and those who were there from the least to the greatest. They didn't kill anyone, but they carried them off and went their way. And so David and his men came into the city and found that it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Does this story sound familiar to you? And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. I think we would do the same yes. if we came and found that our wives and our daughters and our children had been taken by the enemy. And make no mistake, many of them have been. Many of them have been taken by the enemy. It's just a different kind of an enemy. It's a different kind of an enemy called woke and craziness and all the other things that are going on. Same kind of enemy. So what did David do and I just want to cover it in verse 6. Uh, we go down later in all the chapters, and David chased him down and beat him as small as dust. That's what he did. But what did he do first? And this is what we need to do. Verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the people were speaking of stoning him. Because the soul of all of the people were grieved, every man was grieving for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's what we need to do. We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God because God will show us what to do. So David encouraged his heart in the Lord. David's greatest calamity came just a few days before he was established as the king of Israel. Just a few days before the greatest attack came down on him. Likewise, the devil attacks us and brings on great discouragements just before God's blessing comes. Hallelujah. So this is why God tells us not to faint. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, he says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory, in verse 57, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What does it mean to be unmovable? Well, it means we don't accept foolishness. That's what it means. When someone comes up and says, you have to respect me, I'm a furry, don't step on my tail. I don't accept that, you're insane, and I'll pray that your mind will get straightened out and that you'll get saved. Amen? That should be our response. Jesus loves you. And you're not a cat or a dog or anything else. Quit being an idiot and get saved. Amen? Amen? That's what we need to do. We need to stand against it. Don't agree with it. We have a man uh, who spoke here one time who was deceived and changed the sex that he was. He changed into a woman. He was a transgender. And then he came to his senses and received Christ as his Savior and switched everything back as much as he could. And he said, Greg, there is a pattern that these people are promoting. And unless you know the pattern and how to deal with it, you're going to fall into their deception. And their pattern is this. You have to accept who I am. Number two, now I want you to celebrate who I am with me. Number three, then I want you to participate in what I'm doing. So you cut it off at the head. You don't accept it. Hallelujah. Oh, but their feelings will be hurt. 
Well, the poor little feelers, they get hurt too bad. Too bad. Repent and get right with God. That needs to be our answer. Galatians 6, 9 says, Don't be weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you don't faint. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the land have fainted. Uh, and, and if you look, it's the minority. It's not the majority of people. Most of the people that I meet are moral and good people that just want a normal life. It's the screamers that are getting their way. And like that pastor said in Indiana, I know what we need to do with them. Take them off the board and put the board on them. And that's exactly why these children are acting this way, little babies. They're acting this way because they haven't been disciplined. And that's what they need. They need to be disciplined in the Lord and told the truth. Amen? Amen. 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 Glory. Listening to Megan Kelly the other day, I wanted to play her tape, but she got so upset she started cussing, and so I couldn't play it to the church. But she was right on. She was talking about men who go into women's bathrooms. God help whoever does that in this church. It'll be the last thing they ever do. Uh, that will not happen. We have men, we have women, nothing else. Amen. If you're something else, we have a big field in the back. You can go out there. But we have men and women, and I mean it. Hallelujah. I will jump out of this pulpit and jump bad on anybody that goes to assault one of our women in this church or one of our children. Amen. That will not Hallelujah. happen. I'll beat you there, Joe. So one of the ways, and, and you know what? We need more bold people in the country to stand up and, and confront this insanity. Glory. This is craziness. People are going to hell because of this. They're, they're believing the lie of the enemy and they're going to hell. Do you want people to go to hell? I don't. I want to tell them the truth. And their, their feelings may get offended. Tough. You know, I'd rather have them get offended, repent, and get saved rather than feel good about themselves and then go to hell and burn. That's just as simple as I can put it. One of the ways the enemy attacks us is through our past failures. He brings guilt and accusations against us, either through thoughts or through other people that remember what we did. So we battle this by going to God and removing the guilt that God gives us the ability to do through prayer and through repentance and get rid of the shame in our lives. Some people drag around the blanket of shame. God says he's buried our sins as far as the east is from the west. He's put them in the deepest sea. We need to believe God and move forward and be in victory with the Lord. So let's take a look at the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Hallelujah. What does that verse mean? That means when we come clean with God and say, Lord, I know this is what I have done. God says, I'll not only forgive you for what you, what you know you've done, I'll forgive you things that you don't even know you're doing. I will cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. And every one of us has that. There's, there's no one perfect. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God gives us a way to cleanse ourselves and to be healed from all of that. Amen? Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I have people tell me, well, God knows my heart. I love him, but I'm going to live this way. I'm going to be a homosexual. I'm going to be a lesbian. I'm going to be a... a a heroin addict. I'm going to be whatever you want to be. Well, the Bible says this, Proverbs 28, 13. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God will hear us when we're, we come up front with him. But if we decide, Lord, I have my ticket to heaven, but I'm going to live any way I want to live, that's not going to fly before the Lord. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God turns his back on those who are in rebellion against him. So we have to fully face the Lord and come clean. And just say, Father, I know what I did. Y'all know what you did. 
We just bring it before God and accept the blood that was shed on the cross of Jesus to forgive us and then move on. And when we fail, we get back out of the ditch and keep marching forward again. Amen? Amen. Psalm 103, if you'll turn there with me. Psalm 103 is one of the most beautiful psalms in Scripture that talks about our forgiveness. Psalm 103, starting with verse 8. The Bible says the Lord is merciful and gracious. Thank God. And then it says he is slow to anger. He is abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Thank God and praise the Lord. Amen. If he had, none of us would be here. But he hasn't dealt with us according to our sins, nor has he punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And like a father who pities his children, the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame and remembers that we are made of dust. So, you know, dust is smaller than dirt. And we are so frail and so fragile, we can get blown away very easily. So that's why we need to take a stand and not agree with the insanity that Dan talked about. We don't agree with that. And I liked it that you said you'd trip him on the way out of the door. That was awesome, brother. Amen. Who has a right to go into someone's place of business that they've worked hard? I have a good friend that I ride with on Tuesdays. He owned two pawn shops and one jewelry store in Los Angeles. And during the insanity that went on from 2020 to 2022, they burned his stores down, looted them, and took everything. And he and his wife decided, you know what? And Gary, you ride with them. And Louie, you ride with them. And Ben, you ride with them. And there's others in here. Reuben, you ride with them. Corey, you know who I'm talking about. He's a good man. He's a good person. But he got robbed, and, it, and his life was taken away, his, his, his ability to have income. So he moved up to the Central Coast and said, I'm done with that craziness. You know, the police didn't do anything. They just let people burn stuff down, kick windows open, take things. That's craziness. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. Somebody needs to talk about it. Yeah. The Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We have to confront these things. And why our country is in the place that it is, because we've folded our hands and haven't said anything. We need to show up at school board meetings. We need to show up at, at, at supervisory board meetings and say, no, that isn't going to fly. We are, we are your constituents. You will support us or we will remove you. Hallelujah. And that's what we have to do. And Dan talked about that, where we vote. And I know some people say, I'm not going to vote again. It doesn't matter anyway. God's the God of miracles. He's a way maker, a promise keeper. He will have his way in this world, but he's waiting for his people to stand up. Amen. Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Church, we're blessed. Amen. Our sins have been covered. Don't we want to help others get theirs covered as well? We have to confront their evilness. We have to confront them and tell them, this is the way to truth, the life. The way, this is the way, not the way you're going. This is the way. Otherwise, they're going to burn in hell. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, Lord. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. But I acknowledged my sin to you. My iniquity have I not hidden. And I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity Hallelujah. of my sin. For this reason, everyone who is godly will pray to you in a time that you may be found. And surely in a flood of great waters, and I think we're there, 
in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him, for you are my hiding place. You will preserve me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. Amen? Amen. So what are some of those lies that the enemy puts into our minds as Christians? One of them is, well, God has abandoned me. That's such a lie. The scripture says in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness. For God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Praise God. God hasn't abandoned us. He's with us always, even unto the end of the world. Here's another lie. Well, no good is going to come out of any of this. Well, that's not true either. The Bible says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purposes. All things work together. So it's kind of like when you make bread, you've got to have a bunch of ingredients. All things work together. Good things, bad things, happy things, sad things, easy things, hard things, they all work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his purpose. There will be a good answer to all of this in God's good timing because his word says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, God will make everything beautiful in his time. In God's time, he'll make everything beautiful. And our excuse is, but we don't see it. We don't understand what's he doing. Well, the rest of that verse says this, but God has put the world in our hearts, the hearts of the sons of men, not to know the work that God is doing from the beginning even to the end. So if God were Italian and you asked him, what are you doing? He would say, none of you business. You know, because it, he's God. We're not God. So God knows what he's doing. Amen. He knows what he's doing. Here's another lie. Well, I'm not going to forgive this person who hurt me. I'm mad at him. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell because God's word tells us if we don't forgive, and Dan, you touched on this as well, you ripped my whole sermon apart. That's what you did. <laughs> Praise God. Same Holy Spirit. Amen? Same Holy Spirit. God says if we don't forgive everyone from our heart, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. What God says, He means. He means it and He says it. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Why should you not be mad at that person? And you know, I'm preaching to me too. Because there's people I could be angry with until God wakes me up and shows me who I really should be angry with. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against human beings, flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who our enemy is. Our enemy is not, oh, the devil would love us to hate people. But the fact of it is, it's people that are run by demons. So what do we do against the demons? We pray, we come against them, we bring the word of God against them, we cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we do. We fight him in the spirit. Amen? And we trip him out the door like Dan said. Okay. <laughs> Here's another one. Well, God must be punishing you. Remember that one in scripture when the guy was blind? And the disciples said, who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus said, neither. This was done for the glory of God. This was done so God could get the glory. It wasn't that anybody sinned. And boy, it cracks me up sometimes. The way we act as believers, well, they must have done something wrong, man. They're really getting beat up. Well, let's take a look at scripture. What is correction for? What is it for? Is it to hurt people? It's not to hurt people. It's to push us onto the right path. So let's take a look. Hebrews chapter 12. So we were in Ephesians, if you just keep turning to the right. 
you'll come to Hebrews right before the book of James, Hebrews chapter 12. Is any of this making any sense, church? One time I was teaching on a Thursday night. <laughs> I see him back there. <laughs> and uh, I said, church, is this, is this coming through? Is this making any sense? And everybody's kind of going like that. I looked over and Reuben was going. <laughs> totally lost the whole teaching after that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 6. My son, do not despise the correction of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you were rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects or he chastens, and he scourges every son that he receives. In other words, God passes out the old things and brings in the new things. Amen. He takes the parts of our character that are not pleasing to him. He takes that out and brings in new things. Okay. Verse 7. If you endure with correction or chastening, God will deal with you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? So true. But if you were without correction, if you were without chastening, if you're not being convicted, in other words, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons at all. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? For they indeed, our fathers, for a few days corrected us as it seemed best to them, but he does it for our profit, so that we could be partakers of his holiness. Now no correction seems to be joyous for the present time. It seems to be painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So sometimes God does allow us to go through things to make us stronger. He knows what time we're in. He knows we're going to have to be very, very strong until the end of this time because he's coming back soon. And it's going to get crazier. So, there's some good wisdom that we can use in our decisions during times of discouragement. Preacher preached one time and he said, if your move maker's broken, don't make a move. <laughs> I thought that was a really good message. If you're not sure what to do, sit still. God brought you where he brought you for a reason. Don't make a move until God moves you. Because oftentimes what happens is we, we get discouraged or we get into a place where we think, oh man, I'm not happy here, so I'm going to run over to this other place and we take all of our stuff with us over there and then get dragged back to where we were in the first place. So it's better just, uh, just to be still where God put you. Be still until he moves you to some other place. Let's take a look at that Romans chapter 14. So we're in Hebrews. If you turn to your left, past the book of Acts to the book of Romans, Romans the 14th chapter. Hey, this is good stuff. It's God's word. And God instructs us on what to do in times like these. What do we do? Romans 14 verse 22 says, do you have faith? Then have it to yourself before God. Happy is the one who does not con condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he is not eating from faith. Because whatever is not from faith is sin. Now let me boil that one down. If you don't have peace about doing it, if you don't have faith about doing it, don't do it. Well, I'm, I don't think God wants me to do this, but I think I'll do it anyway. Don't do it. Because that's when correction comes in, and oftentimes that is painful. Because God loves his children. He loves us so much, he wants us to come to the right place. So, Proverbs 16 and verse 1, the book of wisdom in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 1. 
The preparations of the heart belong to man. In other words, we, we choose our own path. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So I don't know what to do. What do I do? Get into God's word and ask him, what do I do? Get wisdom from the Lord. God always tells us what to do. Most of the time, in my case, maybe your case as well, here's what God says to me. Trust in me with all your heart. Quit leaning to your own understanding. In all of the things that you do, just acknowledge me. I'm faithful to direct your path. Amen? Just trust in him. He knows what to do. Psalm 27, 14. Wait upon the Lord and be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Man, who likes to wait? Really? I mean, we can't even wait in the line at the fast food place. We can't. Come on, hurry up. What do you order in the whole restaurant? You know, and it's only been like 35 seconds. Uh, you know, we don't like to wait. But God says, you have to wait. Why? Because his timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Okay, so another way to conquer discouragement is to overcome our own pride. It's absolutely true. We have to overcome our own pride. Uh, I, I watched in a parking lot one time where uh, somebody was given a, a gift. I call it a Baptist handshake where they put money in their hand and shake your hand. Uh, they were given a gift and they, and they just said, well, well I, can't, I, can't, I can't receive that. I can't have that. That's pride. We love to give, but we also need to learn how to receive. You know, it, yes, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. I get that. But we're robbing somebody else of a blessing if we, if we refuse to receive their blessing. Then we rob them of being blessed. So we have to get rid of our pride. So Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, past the book of Isaiah, it's turned to your right. We were in Psalms. So Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 9. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who puts his trust in man. So I'll tell you one of the reasons we get so angry is we put our trust in the, the people in D.C. and in Sacramento instead of putting our trust in the Lord. Let me just give you a news flash. You can't trust them and you can't trust him. We have to trust him. We can't trust people. We can love people. We can encourage people. But our trust needs to be in the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who puts his trust in men and makes flesh his strength because his heart will depart from the Lord. Well, sure, you can't trust two sides. You either trust the Lord or you trust this guy. And if you trust this guy, your heart departed from the Lord. And if you trust the Lord, then your heart departs from trusting in them. Verse 6. That man who trusts in men will be like a shrub in the desert and will not see when good comes, but will inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord whose hope is in the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, who spreads out its roots by the river, and he will not fear when the heat comes. But his leaf will be green, and he will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will he cease from yielding fruit. Trusting God means we're, we're going to prosper in the Lord. Hallelujah. We're not going to be afraid. Hallelujah. We're going to prosper. God will provide. Glory. We have proved that over and over and over again. In our lives, in your lives, God is faithful. Marcia, God even gave you an angel in your hospital place. I praise God for that. God is faithful. Yes. Now the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? We think we know our own heart. We don't. Here's what the scripture says, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So we really have to repent from our pride. We have to repent from that 
and humble ourselves before the Lord. So James, the book of James, chapter 5, tells us how to do that. The book of James, after the book of Hebrews, James 5, starting with verse 13, tells us, Is there anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Then let him sing psalms. Is there anyone among you that's sick? Well, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Notice it wasn't the prayer of the pastor, the prayer of the elders. It was the prayer of faith will save the sick. But who's going to raise him up? The Lord will raise him up. Amen? Yes. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. So the part of getting rid of our pride is confessing our faults one to another and pray for one another that we can be healed. For the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In that same book, in James chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, but God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then in verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. Hallelujah. That's another way to conquer discouragement, to humble ourselves. Hallelujah. Amen? Yes. And just as important is to focus where you are in the Lord. Where are you in the Lord? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Or do you have a relationship with Him? Then focus on who you are in the Lord. God does not see us as we see us. We look in the mirror and go, oh man, what happened? You know, God looks at us as what we can be and who He sees us as. Amen? So the Bible sees us this way, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who's already given us the victory. In Jesus Christ our Lord. So we already won the battle. We've already won the game. We've already got the victory. We just have to play through. We've already got it. Romans chapter 8. I love Romans chapter 8. It, it has such great encouragement. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39. Think about these verses as I read them. What then should we say? We sang about it this morning. If God is for us, who can be against us? Okay, so what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who judges. He's the one who justifies. I've had people come up and say things to me that I didn't agree with. And I usually tell them, can I see your hands? And they say, what for? And I said, because I need to see your hands. That's why. So they go like that. And I look at them and I go, yep, just as I thought, no nail holes. You have no right to pass judgment on me because you didn't pay for me. There's only one who paid for me. He's the one who judges me. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses, uh, verse 3 through 5. He said, you know, it's a very small thing with me that, that I be judged by you or by man's judgment. I don't even judge myself because he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, we are to judge nothing before the time, but wait for him who is the righteous judge to come. That's when every man will have his own reward from God. So when we try to pass judgment on each other, God says, don't do that because you don't know their heart. You don't know their motives. You don't know their story. You don't know what they're going through. Just pray for them. And so uh, we, get, we get into Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Who is the one who can condemn? It is Christ who died. And furthermore has also risen, who is even now at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for us. Did you know that Jesus is praying for every single one of us all the time? 
He's interceding for us all the time according to the Father's heart. Okay, who is going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Is any of that going to separate us from God's love? Our brothers in Africa are being hacked down because they're Christians. That didn't separate them from the love of God. That got them to the throne room. Hallelujah. Our brothers in North India are being persecuted. Our, our pastor friends are being burned to the ground. Their churches are being knocked down. Their, their people are being assaulted physically. Is that going to separate them from the love of God? It is not. It's only painful for a moment, and then they're in the presence of Christ. I pray that it won't happen to us. I don't know. I don't know what God has planned for America. As it is written, the Bible says, for your sake we're killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. Because I am persuaded, verse 30, 38 I am persuaded that neither death nor life, that's nothing in dying or nothing in living, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything that's happening in your life right now, nor things present, nor things to come, nothing in the future, nothing tomorrow, nothing next week, nothing next year, nor anything high or low or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our position in Christ. We can't be touched. Yeah, we may lose our physical life through sickness, death, persecution, whatever, but we will not lose our eternal soul. Our soul is secure with Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are kept by the power of God through faith, ready to be revealed in the last time through salvation. We're kept. So God is keeping us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in us than the one who's in the world. So greater is the Holy Spirit who lives in us than the devil who tries to beat us down in the world. 1 John chapter 5, if you'll turn there with me, right before the book of Revelation you'll find... Uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. So we're, we're in 1st John 5 and verse 4. Whatever is born of God... So let me ask you a question. Are you born again? Yes. Yes. Are you born of God? Yes. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Look, I don't think this is ever going to straighten out with the craziness that's going on. Like Dan said, it has been this way forever. It's all written in the Bible. You can, you can go back all the way back into history and find evilness everywhere you look. The only one who's going to fix this is Jesus Christ. No man is going to fix this. No hero, no poli especially no politician. No, none of that is going to fix this. Only the Lord Jesus Christ but since he's left us here until he comes back, we are the light of the world. Therefore, our light is to so shine before men that they can see our good works and then glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Amen? Hallelujah. So when we face discouragement, we can run to the Lord and cast all of our burdens on him. That's what we need to do. Sometimes we just sit in depression... And I know because I've been there. And I'm sure y'all have been there too. Sometimes we just sit in it and wallow in it like a bar of soap. You know, we wash ourselves in it. God says, don't do that. He says, run to me. So let's take a look. Psalm 55, 22. How do we do that, Lord? How do we run to you? So the book of Psalms 55 and 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Cast your burden upon the Lord. How do I do that? Well, some people say just imagine it that it's in your hands 
and look at it and say, Lord, this, this is my burden right here. This is what I'm carrying. A son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a friend. This is, this is my burden. Cast it upon the Lord. The Bible says, cast your burden upon the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. God says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So I worked on a farm when I was growing up, and I know what a yoke is. A yoke is this wooden thing. Sometimes it's an iron thing, but typically it's a wooden thing that you put around the, the necks of two animals, and then you pull a plow behind them. So that's a yoke. So who do you think pulls the hardest when Jesus is in the yoke with you? <laughs> Amen? Well, it'd be like when, well, I used to help people move all the time. But now that I'm older, the younger guys that are helping me, I, it looks like I'm helping, <laughs> but, but they're doing all the lifting. It's the same thing with Jesus. When he's in the yoke with us, he's the one pulling the weight. And we're, we're doing what he said for us to do. Follow me. He said, follow me. So we're following him. He's pulling the plow and we're following him. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Lo love this verse. There is no test that has come upon you other than that which is common to man. How many times has the enemy tried to tell you, huh, you're the only one going through this. Everybody else looks like they're doing fine. Yeah, God must hate you. Something wrong with you. No. <laughs> These same things are accomplished in our brethren all throughout the world. We're all the same. We all struggle. We all have these things that test us and try us. But look what God does. Through waiting, through prayer, through patience, we see the end of our prayers. Amen? Yeah, I've been praying for a guy for 35 years. 35, uh, since he was a young man. And now I find out that he's, he's doing so great. He's in another town. He's in a, in a, in a program, uh, doing very, very well. His life has been cleaned up. He's about ready to take on a new job. It's a wonderful thing. It took 35 years. But you know what? Sometimes we have to wait that long of a time in order to see God move because God has to put all the pieces in place. And we want it today or yesterday or 10 minutes from now. And God says, in my time, I'll make it beautiful. In his time. So I want to close with this scripture before we have communion this morning because we now, we, we now can face the fact, humble ourselves, and say, yeah, We've been discouraged. We've been disenchanted. We've, we've seen some craziness happen in our land, and it's disappointing. But now we know how to get the victory. So 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 6. What do we talk about? God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that he can exalt you in due time. God, I'm going to put myself under your hand and I know at the right time in the right place you're going to lift me up. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. That's one of the things we need to hear. God cares for you. He loves you. He loves me. He cares for us. So the scripture says be sober or serious be vigilant. Don't go to sleep. This is not the time to go to sleep. This is not the time to close the church down. It is not the time to dump all the services and just stay open on Sunday morning. This is the time for us to even more push towards. Even like the scripture says, so much more as you see the day approaching. Amen? So much more should we be vigilant now. Why should we do that? Because your adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom 
he may devour. Heard a story this morning as we were talking in, in prayer this morning with, with the elders. Uh, they said they knew this person who really loved the Lord, serving the Lord on fire for God. One day they just decided, you turn, walk away, walk away from God, walk away from the whole nine yards. It makes me almost wonder, were they truly born again? I don't know. Only God knows. But I know that if there's no chastisement, then there's no Father in heaven. Because God only corrects his children. Amen? But we see people like that all the time now where, wow, what happened to them? They just walked away. They walked into craziness. What happened? Well, it's because they didn't strengthen themselves in the Lord. It's because they were trusting in men instead of trusting in God. It's because they got discouraged and walked away. That's not a time for us to do that now. Our Savior is very near. I used to say, well, I think he's at the door until somebody told me I think he turned the doorknob. And I don't know how close the Lord is. I know I'm closer than when I first believed. I know we're closer than when we first believed. And one way or the other, we're going to be there with him whether we go before or whether we go during the rapture. So the enemy's walking about seeking whom he may devour. What are we to do? Well, the next verse. Resist him. Be steadfast in the faith. Say no. I'm not accepting that. Well, you're a bigot. Whatever. You know, you call me what you want to call me. I'm not accepting it. You know, that's what they call you now if you're conservative. You're a bigot. You're a racist. No, I'm not a racist, and I'm not a bigot. You're insane, and you need to get right with God and get saved. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brethren in the world, and a lot worse. I have a good friend who has a mission in North India. He sends me these letters with stories that just make you cry of what, what's happening to Christians over there. And so I, I look at that and I think, boy, my troubles are so little compared to what's happening with so many believers all over the world. And it, it does appear that it's coming our way and we have to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We can't just put our head in the sand and ignore it. We have to face it, resist it. The Bible says resist it. And then in verse 10, my prayer for all of us today is, May the God of all peace, who has called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, that after maybe we have been tested or suffered a little while, that we would be mature, established, strengthened, and settled. Amen? Yes. Amen, church. God bless you. We're going to prepare for communion. I'd like to have... Dealing with uh, troubled times, church. We've got to deal with it. Amen? We have to stand up. Amen. Amen. One of the ways we can do that is have communion with our Lord. Spend time with Him. Yes. So I think most everyone has been here when we've had communion. And we ask you to form two lines and come forward and take the elements. But if you're unable to, uh, we'll have... Two of the elders go and bring the elements to you. So would you stand with me, church? The Bible says this. In the same night that Jesus was betrayed, could everybody just kind of turn around and look at that picture on the back wall there? That's a resemblance of Jesus praying in the garden, and I think it was a lot worse than that. But he was praying for us. If you read John chapter 17, it is the prayer of Christ for us as he was leaving. That whole chapter, John chapter 17, is all about Jesus' prayer for us. He prays that we would be strengthened. He prays that we would be one. He prays that we would not forget the things that he taught us. He prays that we, we would be with him where he is. So that was his prayer for us. And here we are in his presence. So the same night he was betrayed, after the garden experience, uh, after the, the, the meal, he was betrayed, he went to the garden, and then they captured him in the garden, and all of his friends ran away. 
They all ran. Later, John was found at Caiaphas' house because that was his relative. And Peter was found there, but he was outside the gate. And we know what Peter did. He denied the Lord three times out of fear. Well, he didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do. So he didn't have the power to resist. But, but Jesus was betrayed by everyone. And so the scripture says, in the same night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And that was a symbol of what was coming to him. His body would be broken. It would be crushed. I've studied some of the things that happened to the Lord. Uh, when it said the crown of thorns, we kind of get this picture of a rose bush. But those thorns in Israel are at least two inches long. So they were long thorns. And they pushed that on top of his scalp. And we know if you've ever cut your head, uh, that's where a lot of the blood uh, just rushes out quickly, especially in a head wound. It rushes out. So they, they slammed that crown of thorns on him. His body was broken. They whipped him. They ripped the flesh right off of his back with a whip. They slapped him and hit him in the face. And then they took a reed and, and hit him with it. And then they gave it to him to mock like, a, like a, a, the crown of thorns and a, and a scepter. They, they mocked him and put a purple robe on him. And then when he was getting ready to go to be crucified, they ripped that robe off him. And you know as well as I do, if you have a wound and you put something on it and then tear it off quickly, how it just opens everything all back up again. That's what Jesus did for us. When he broke the bread, it was a symbol of his body being broken for us. And then the scripture says he took the cup and he said, take and drink all of this. This is the blood that it will be shed for you for the remission of sins. I won't drink this fruit of the vine with you again until I drink it anew with you in my kingdom. So Jesus said, my blood is going to be spilled. That's the only thing that will wash away sin. And I had a hard time understanding why the blood, why just not the beating? Well, the scripture says when Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves up with animals, with, uh, excuse me, with leaves. And so they tried to cover up their sin. And God says the wages of sin is death. So something had to die and shed its blood in order to cover their sins. And that's why God put coats of animals on them to show that a death had to happen because of the sin. And that was really the first place in Scripture where God was foretelling what would happen to him because of our sins. That he would be the Lamb of God, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So that's what communion is really about, is remembering what Jesus did for us, what he's done for us, and what he continues to do for us. Amen? So would you form two lines here, and I'm going to pray, and then we'll go ahead and receive our elements. And if you'll just hold on to them until, uh, until we partake together. Father, I want to thank you for the message today. Lord, you know I not only share the word with my brethren, but I preach to me as well. Lord, there's been many times I've been discouraged, and you've taught me, Lord, things, and I want to pass them on to my brethren so that we're not of those who turn away, not of those who let go of the faith, but those of us who stay strong. So I pray today, Lord, as we partake in these elements called communion, that we spend some time with you, just speaking to you. If there are things that are not right in our lives, help us to confess that before you quietly this morning, Lord, so that we can be forgiven. And I pray now you will bless us as we partake in communion with you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can come forward, church. God bless you. Joe, Mr. Kevin.
punishment that was due For our peace was laid on you By your stripes we are here Rest and afflicted Despised and rejected Justified by faith through the riches of your grace by your stripes we are healed our sins were once like scarlet now are white as snow once they were God bless you, church. By his stripes, we are healed. Yeah, scripture says we are and we were. So, Pastor Loida, I would like to ask you if you would pray as we partake of the bread. Would you do that for us? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Would you partake with us? In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, drink all of it. For this is my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. And I will not drink this with you again until I drink it anew with you in my kingdom. Someday, and I pray it'll be soon and very soon, 
we will be in his kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we will enjoy this with the Lord Jesus Christ, our communion. Amen? So, Robert, I would like to ask you to, if you would pray and thank the Lord for his shed blood. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Father, to lift this glass in remembrance of the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us. Yes, Lord. To the place of that perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. shed that blood for the remission of our sins, Jesus. So Lord, we thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you took that punishment in our place. Lord. So Lord, we praise you, we Jesus. thank you, and we give you all glory. And we lift up this juice and we drink it in remembrance of that. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. We will never know what he went through, but we know that he loves us, and he has forgiven us, and he has cleansed us and healed us. Thank you, brother. Amen. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Amen. Church, would you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Take some time to greet one another. It's only three in the afternoon. So. It's straight up 12 o'clock. So take some time to greet one another. And uh, God bless you today as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for the time we've been able to spend. There's some really wonderful promises that we've heard today. We don't go by feelings, Father. We go by faith. So help us to be strong in our faith. I pray you will bless each and every one who's attended here today, and their families, Lord. And we thank you and praise you and ask that you bless us now as we depart from this place, but not from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you, church. If you do need prayer, we'll be uh, up front here to pray with you. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. Peace was laid on you by